Hi, I'm Steve Blevins. Welcome to, to week two of Set Free. So last time, if you watched that video, we talked about Jesus' authority and how the authority originally came from God, was passed uh, down, unfortunately, to the enemy through man's disobedience. But then Jesus came and he won it back <laughs> very distinctively. And so then he passed the authority to us in his name. And so this week, we're gonna actually talk about that enemy. And one of his greatest tricks is that he doesn't want anybody to really know he exists. Because if you don't have an enemy, then you don't fight against him and you just blame yourself for everything. And I think a lot of people do that. They just blame themselves. You know, that's my stinking thinking or, or I'm just make bad choices or I'm destined to be this. And many people do play the if only game. If only I was smarter, if only I was wiser, if only I was prettier, if only I was had more money, if only I had more opportunities, then I could be set free. Then I could have peace and joy and love and happiness. But that's not what the word says. It says that that's a gift from the spirit. So we need to kick the enemy out of the camp so he'll quit stealing our stuff and then claim those gifts for ourselves. So as we said, the enemy is the, is the devil, he's Satan. And his original name was Lucifer, which means the shining one or morning star, or the son of the morning. And he was a chief cherubim. So he was kind of number two to God in heaven. And he was created to worship God, just like all of us. And in Ezekiel 28, 13, 1, this is a little bit long, but bear with me. It says, you were in Eden. He's talking to Satan, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created and prepared, you were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I... God is speaking here, ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you. So Lucifer was in the garden and we know that too because he tempted Eve. And he also was in the presence of God. And he, he knows all that, that, he doesn't know all that God knows, heaven, heaven forbid, but he knows the Bible as well as God because he was there when it was written. He was there when the Holy Spirit was, was around. And now he fell because he decided to be disobedient. He, he got tired of being gloriously beautiful and radiant and reflecting God's glory and he thought he could be God and so he rebelled with one-third of the angels and they uh, lost because I don't know how the creation ever thinks it could beat the creator but you know sometimes that little bit of pride gets in there right and we think that we can do it all hmm. maybe he's not the only one who thinks that so so we fight this battle with, with this guy that is very powerful. You know, he was with God from, we, we assume from the beginning, since he was kind of this second in command. And um, he got very prideful and lost. Isaiah also has some references to him. In Isaiah 14, he says, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, who you who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, but you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. I always, I always kind of think it's interesting in these moments, like it says, I will make myself like the Most High. Apparently, there's still this little piece where he knows he's not ever going to make it. 
but he's still going to try, and he's still going to try to keep us from getting there. So in Luke 10, verse 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So if we know that the word, because we learned that in the first, is, is the, the living, holy word of God, and it was inspired and written through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and that it's all true, and Jesus said he saw Satan, then I think we can believe that there's a Satan. So then, yeah, Lucifer was not alone. He fell with one third of the, because a lot of times people will say to me, well, Steve, you know, Satan's just one guy. You know, so he doesn't have time to bother with me. And it's kind of like the government, you know, like they, they can't see me. I'm so small. I'm just this little bitty fish in this little bitty pond. And, and, and I'd like to be a little bitty fish in a great big pond, but, you know, I'm not there yet. But, but he, he has minions, and they're not the cuddly, cute yellow kind. You know, these, these little minions have assignments and the assignment is to go out and steal the things that you're supposed to be getting from God because all good things come from God. And so God has a lot of good things in store for us. And he says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. And so the enemy doesn't want that. He doesn't want you out there being prosperous and being joyful and being happy because, you know, the people might see it and want that too. So in Revelation 12, 4, it confirms that, that he's got a few guys with him. And it says, his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. So I often kind of have people ask me like, well, how many is a third of the angels that were in heaven? And I don't know. I don't know that any of us here would, could ever know. You know, if God knows the number of hairs that are left on my head, then he knows, but he's probably the only one, right? But in Revelation, it says that when Jesus returns, he will return with legion upon legion upon legion of angels. Now, I was in the service, and we use different terminology, but, but a legion is a bunch, right? And this is not this legion plus this legion. It's legion times legion times legion. It's it's, you know, t you know, square root, making this thing so great that they're basically innumerable. But a third of them fell. So he has plenty of little minions to assign to you and me to, to keep us from having peace and joy and love and to keep us walking in that little circle, you know, like, how did I get here again? I didn't want to do this again, but here I am again because we've created these strongholds. And strongholds are great, you know. We can go behind the walled city and we can feel protected, but, you know, nothing good comes in and nothing good goes out when the gates are closed. So stronghold isn't always, always a good thing. So in Revelation 12, 7, 9, it says, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan. He has a lot of names. And the dragon and his angels fought back. <laughs> what do you think happened? <laughs> but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth, and his angels with him. Sometimes I wonder, you know, could he have been hurled somewhere else? You know, so that we wouldn't be messing with us. God had a plan. <laughs> and and in in the course of that plan, we got to meet Jesus. So, you know, that's, a, that's not a bad trade-off. Um, Matthew 25, 41 says, Then he will say to those, this is, this is Jesus now, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I added emphasis there, obviously, with the little air quotes. But it's just to, to make a point, like the enemy is not in this battle alone, but guess what? You're not either. So Satan has his own army to engage the believers in warfare. So I was in this army for 23 years, 
And one of the first things we learned in basic training is that we hated basic training. And, and the second thing we learned is that we didn't really know a lot about what we needed to know to go into battle. And that's why we had to go to basic training. And in that process, we learned a lot about what we could do and what our capabilities were. And, and we need to know that, and we're gonna learn that in the fourth week. But we also learned about the enemy and what his capabilities are and when, what tactics he likes to use and how, you know, how he likes to apply the pressure. And we're gonna learn that in the third week, so hang with us. So keep in mind that if you, oh, this is a big one, and I kind of say this it, with gentleness, please take it that way. Keep in mind that if you are not engaged in the battle, it may mean that instead of being in the active army, you may be in the reserve forces. The enemy doesn't need to expend a lot of resources for those who are not actively engaged in God's work. So sometimes people just say, you know, look, I don't really, I, nobody's really getting me, nobody's coming at me. Sometimes I ask them, well, what are you doing? Because I know for me personally, when I'm in my lazy boy and I got my feet up and I'm watching TV, he didn't bother me much either. But I'm not doing much either. So keep in mind that the more you go through these steps, the more that you start to take an active role in setting yourself free, the enemy's going to come against you. And so just let us know that we can come together with you to fight that battle with you because you're not in this alone. So what are the enemy's plans? <clears throat> well, he wants to, to interrupt and destroy relationships. That's kind of his big thing is to just destroy the relationship that you have with God. And if he can, the relationship you have with other people, 67% of marriages end in divorce. Kids are running around doing all kinds of crazy things. We can't even decide, you know, if you're born one way, you can be a different way and you, you, nobody knows what's what. So one of the things that he does is he's deceitful and he's subtle and he's sneaky. But let's go over some of, some of his names. Sometimes the name or what someone is called can tell you a lot about their nature, right? So here's a few of Lucifer slash Satan, some of his names. He's in First Peter called your adversary. Now, I don't know about you, but my adversary doesn't usually ever do anything good for me. He's the accuser of our brethren. So think of that, that, you know, you're going to court and you've got this prosecuting attorney and all he does is say, well, look, you did this and you did that and you did this and I can't believe you did that. And how could you think you could get away with that? Well, we, we're not. And he's going to accuse us, but we have a pretty good defense attorney too, which we're going to talk about in week four. He's called the deceiver. He's called the destroyer. He's called the evil one. He's called the prince of the power of air, which means he's the ruler of evil spirits. He's the ruler of this world, which means he's the ruler of the wicked people in the world. And he will often use those people who are really not on the right path to influence us. He is called the serpent in Genesis and in Revelation. And I'm not a big snake fan. I know some people are, but that just gives me the heebie-jeebies. And lastly, he's called the tempter. He literally tried to tempt Jesus, and he tempts us all the time. So in that, we go back to those what ifs. You know, that's what he tempts us with. The, if, if you said, what if I had more money, then that might be the thing that he tempts you with. <clears throat> in John 8.44, he, they're talking to the people that are not believers yet. And, they, and he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue, for he is a liar and the father of lies. One of the gifts that we can get is discernment, and that's the ability to see where the enemy is and the ability to see where God is. And when you get that, you, you should pray for that because when we see where the enemy is and he's talking, just 
no, it's not true. <laughs> because he is the father of lies. Even when he tries to quote scripture, and as he did with Jesus, you know, two different times, he'll tweak it or modify it or, or ask you the question, well, is that what it really says? So, yes, that's what it really says. So we just have to stand on the truth of the word because that's our defense system. So his big plan, if we look at all those names and we put them all together, his big plan is to lead us to the same destruction he is facing. Because, you know, misery loves company. And he wants as much company as he can get. So he does this by using deceit, accusations, and temptation. And he will enlist the aid of many of his soldiers, or as many as he needs, to attempt to thwart God's plans and distract or put obstacles in our paths. And he's pretty good about that. Paul warns us of this battle and on the necessity of being equipped. And this is from Ephesians. It's the, called the armor of God. And Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, not ours, his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. In many places, those things are broken down like, like squad, company, platoon, out of order, battalion, brigade. And, and so the enemy has literally battalions to call against you. And, and we have to therefore take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So they're going to be shooting at you. And take the helmet of salvation to protect the, uh, your thoughts. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It says it's a double-edged sword cleaving between flesh and bone. So it's a pretty powerful weapon. And Jesus used it through all three of his temptations. He said, it is written. Lastly, Paul says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Lastly, when we, I want to dis, end the discussion of the enemy by reminding you that God is all powerful. Romans 8 38. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Thank you.